Hello, I'm Liz Fraley, and welcome to my virtual STC Summit session on style guides. I first gave this presentation at STC Summit in 2019. I had standing room only and people out in the hall. They asked me to reprise this session for Summit 2020. Thanks for coming today. Type your questions in as we go. I like it best when I can talk to people, not just at them. So please type in your questions, your comments, your stories, and whatever comes to mind. I promise it'll be a better session for all of us. Thank you. Again, I'm Liz Fraley. The four adjectives in the column on the left are leadership personal inventory technique, where you make lists of words and roll them up. These are the four words that describe me. Scientist. I am a computer scientist. I have a BS. I also have an MA and BA in English. I'm a researcher and experimenter. I read over 200 books, thousands of articles, blogs, news, and mailing lists every year. I lurk everywhere. I'm a researcher. I may not know the answer, but I always know where to get it, or at least how to find it. I'm like that librarian behind the research desk at the library. That same knack for research means I invest in learning and the learning of my customers and communities. For me, it's about investing in that community and investing in learning. Our staff donates 20% of their time to community projects. I sit on the boards, volunteer for three nonprofits, one of which I started. I launched the TC Dojo webinar series where the topics are chosen by the members of the community. We know that you want to learn and so do we. We know that we all learn best when we invest in our people, our customers, and our communities. We are very conservative with the time and money our customers entrust to us. It's just who we are. We train our customers to take over what we've done, telling them what we did and the reasoning behind it so they can grow their capabilities. We teach people to create, not just do. We meet people where they are and help them get where they want to go. We're always searching for new ways to increase the knowledge of the professionals in the communities we serve. For us, it's about empowerment, enablement, and this is our way of bringing people together to share knowledge, ask questions, and enable each other. What comes to mind when I say style guide? Type your answer into the chat system. Some of the more common answers I get from TechCom folks are rules, controlled vocabulary, formatting, corporate branding, writing guidelines, voice, and tone. All very good answers. Here's what my answer is. It's a consistent experience for end users, no matter who creates the content or how it's delivered. It's the guidelines that provide the consistent experience. But it does other things too. It offloads effort so you don't have to keep everything in your head. It adds institutional memory, which is the history of the whys, the hows, and the decisions that were made to aid with staff turnover. It can also help with onboarding so that new people can come up to speed quicker and become productive faster. However, if you ask this question to other people, the general public. The most common answer I get is a reference document for formatting. In particular, it's the formatting of research, reference lists, and citations. Do you use the APA format or the MLA format or Chicago style? And it's not surprising to get this answer because we've been trained through all the years of school. We want the rest of our community to accept our work and recognize the research we've done. Let's talk about what that means. Fundamentally, it's that the type defines the format. If you're writing a citation for one author, it's different than if you're writing one for three authors, or an unknown author, or an author and a translator, or multiple works by the same author in the same year or in different years. There are formats for letters to the editor, for per periodicals, for film reviews, for blog entries, for songs and podcasts and other sources. Each one of these, depending on what you're citing, is formatted in a specific way. And in addition, which format you use marks you as being a member of a particular group. For example, the MLA looks slightly different than the APA and both look different than the Chicago Manual of Style. These examples come from the citation chart at Purdue University's online writing lab. It's a fascinating resource to read through. It gives you examples of all possible cases and the differences between them. MLA puts more emphasis on the author, showing both first and last name. 
APA has less interest in the author and more interest in the time frame and what's being documented. Hence the initials for author's first name and more information on the date and when it was retrieved and the context it came from. Which format you choose identifies you as being having a background of MLA or APA. If you want to compare them, you can dig into the citation style chart for more information about the different styles. And it will talk about how the MLA places more emphasis on authorship because it's part of the humanities. It'll tell you that the APA is talking about social sciences. So its emphasis is on the date and when the work was created. Both have higher significance than the authorship. They also care more about whether it was a recording or a physical text. It's a different perspective and the format reflects that. On the other hand, Chicago Manual of Style is more about the bibliography and the author date system. It places more emphasis on source origins, footnotes and notes, where information comes from, rather than who wrote it or when it was written. In addition to references and how citations are constructed, these style guides also cover a few other things, such as they talk about primary resource methods, how to do interviews, how to make observations, how, and then how you document that, how to do primary source research. They also talk about how to do secondary source research from books or journals or the internet. They include practical advice about evaluating research sources, how to quote or paraphrase as to avoid plagiarism, how to write with statistics, how to avoid bias, and write abstracts. Now, abstracts are significant for technical writers. DITA has a focus on short descriptions and titles and the ideas are similar. How you format your citations, how you format your documents, that's also found here. We talked about citations, but they also include advice for differentiating headings, working with seriation rules, tables, and figures. More recent editions have started to include advice about strategies for fair use, something we all face if we're including references to popular culture or memes or GIFs or from some other source. You need to know how you can use those without getting into trouble. So if this is the first most common answer, what's the second one? The next most common answer I get is that it's a writing style guide, a reference for writing style, how you write. The Chicago Manual also includes this guidance, but so does the Microsoft Manual of Style and Strunk and White. Many of these, all of these, should be familiar to all of us. Writing style guides are about writing practices. They're guidelines for usage of terminology, of grammar, of capitalization, of spelling. It also includes guidance for voice, spelling out how the corporate voice should be characterized. That includes things like word choice and tone, passive voice versus active voice. And do you write in first, second, or third person? How should the content be written? How do you address the reader? Do you address the reader? What approach do you take? What is the personality of the corporate writer? It may or may not also include how you're going to use simplified technical English, or really, if you're going to use it at all, or which parts you intend to use. You want to make sure that any style guide at this level the writing style guide includes guidelines that are unique to you, your products, your company, your content, and your customer. It's not enough to simply point to the Chicago Manual of Style. You have to make sense of it in your own context. You want to provide guidelines that directly reference your customers, your company, your context, your situation. For example, rather than just writing with the Chicago style, Use it as a model that you extend for your own. You can list the specifics of your situation and refer back to Chicago to settle disputes that are more generally applicable and that are not specifically called out in your corporate style guide. Chicago becomes the fallback for rules, not otherwise specified. 
you don't have to reproduce it, but you should extend it to cover your own situation. You want to include company and product specific issues. What is the proper use of the company and product name? What is improper? Can the company name or the product name be used as a possessive? This is not as obvious as it would seem. Legal always has something to say here. What about copyrights and trademarks? How can they be used? Are they nouns? Adjectives? Can they be used as possessives? These are all things you need to specify in your writing style guide. Here are some places to start if you're ready to extend and start creating your own style guide. You want to include things like punctuation, abbreviations, common practices for field definitions that are used all across your product. You want to promote consistency in description and presentation and include guidelines for length, format, decimal precision, etc. You want to establish standards for your terms. Is it hit or click or click on? Is it select and clear or is it check and uncheck? You want to make sure everyone uses the same words consistently for comprehension and clarity to your customers. What about emphasis? In this case, it's not just usage, but overuse. What part does emphasis play in assigning significance in your text? For what and how should emphasis be used? Images are another good inclusion. What format? What resolution? How do you create callouts and reference them? Are there ways to do callouts that result in content that is more or less amenable to translation, making this a critical inclusion if you're localizing your content? Either way, you want a standard way to handle images so they're all presented consistently. Error messages, code examples, capitalization, pronoun usage, verb tense, all of these are places to start and should be included in your writing style guide. An extremely important part of any style guide is the inclusion of examples. They are almost more important than the rule. It's easier to understand and interpret an example than it is to read and interpret a description. In fact, it's even easier to interpret when you have both a good and bad example. Having both a correct and incorrect example, as well as the guideline, can give you a way to make the rule meaningful to someone who's reading the style guide and trying to figure out what to do. For example, this one says, spell out United States whenever possible. If abbreviation is necessary, use U period S period, not US, USA, or U period S period, A period, and don't spell it out on the first mention. We've got a fairly comprehensive rule and a decisive answer that refers to another fairly common rule regarding acronyms. This example is from Kathy Jones at Jack Henry, who did a TC JoJo webinar in 2018, and the rule reflects their business, their knowledge of their customer, and the position they want to take in their documentation. They spell it out in their corporate style guide so they don't have to waste time and money and resources tracking down all the different ways this could go. First is a problematic concept anyway, especially if your content is on the web. Where exactly is first? How did the user get here? They're not reading from front to back. Give a good example, give a bad example, and describe the guideline as well. There are other things you can include at this level, like the use of gender neutral language. How are you going to use it? Are you going to use it? What are the guidelines when you do? Who is the audience you're writing for? A good description of the audience at this level will help make sure the rest of the rules are easily understood. When do you use gerund phrases? Hyphens N or M dash. This last one, sensitive customer information on images, has become more important because it's becoming more of an issue. How do you handle sensitive customer information in images? Sometimes you can see through things that are just blacked out in a PDF, or if you had a Word document around that had changed tracking in its history. A few rules about making screenshots will help your team do things in the best possible way to preserve your customer information. That's two. What's the third most common style guide? Typically, it's a format specification for the layout and design of the official look and feel for output. This is often a FrameMaker template or a Word template 
or your CSS and style sheets? It's a popular answer as well. This is paragraph styles, character styles, it's look and feel. If you want to think of a format style guide as more of a specification, that's a good way to look at it. This document is the detailed standard for look and feel for any deliverable type. It should cover format specific decisions that are not in the writing style guide. Include as much specific information as you can, so the implementer, the style sheet, or template designer can implement the desired look and feel. Every style guide should always be a living document, continuing to evolve and reflect current practices. It needs to be updated wherever there are style changes. Although, it may seem I'm talking more about printed documents, this is not entirely accurate. Even web pages have layout design specifications. I'm talking about that design specification. This is the documentation about what is implemented in the CSS or in the template. I can guarantee that if you think a CSS is self-documenting, you've never had to go and debug someone else's. You won't remember what you did next year when marketing comes to you ready for a whole new look and feel, never mind trying to remember it next week. None of what I'm talking about is deliverable specific. Document your format design decisions for all of your deliverables. You'll thank me later. This is what this level style guide is for. Here are some places to start with this level specification. Official colors, fonts, and typefaces. For print, what size pages are you producing and how do you handle blanks? Do you say this page intentionally left blank or do you just leave it blank? For web, you want to know how do you break up pages, especially if you're generating multiple pages. There may be times when you don't want things to break in a particular way and cases when you do. What are those cases and can you lay out the rules? What about tables of contents and nav bars? Are there limitations for inclusion or exclusion? Do you include all the headers or just down to a certain level? Does that change for different delivery types? How do you handle generated text, like contents or table of contents? Which should authors use? No one should ever have to type that. It should be generated by whatever is governing format generation. Similarly, how are links constructed? Do you put the title of the target page, the URL? What goes there? Do you also include a go to or see? Anything that's generated needs to be specified at this level, as does anything that is unique to a specific deliverable type and is part of the automatic formatting. These are the things that are PDF only, and these are the things that are HTML only, and lay out the differences between them so your implementers know where to fix things and where to find them. This can include indents, numbering schemes, other spacing issues. What you have here at this level is your specification. Here's a print example. I will typically lay out on graph paper and measure specifically to get layout coordinates. I want to know exactly where things fall on the page so that when I'm implementing, all I have to do is execute. Just like the other style guides include an example that has both the representation, the example you're aiming for, and the description of the guideline in words. The equivalent of this is for web is wireframes. Designers do very similar things for web design to lay it out and how it's supposed to look and figure out where things should fall on the page, including how it changes when you switch viewports and dimensions. All of that needs to be documented. Here again, we have examples. A good style guide includes both the description of the design and an example of the design so that you know what you're aiming for. Think of this level style guide as a spec because that's what it is. If that's three, What's our last type of style guide? This one doesn't always get the attention it deserves. Most of us take it for granted. We take it for granted that we can use someone else's guidelines to do all the heavy lifting. But like that second level style guide, you can use someone else's guidelines as a foundation that you extend and apply to your own content. I call this level the tagging style guide. Some call it an authoring style guide. You might hear information model or did a style guide. 
especially if they're talking about data. You really only find these when you have XML authoring and not simply desktop publishing environments. Here's what goes in this kind of style guide. XML content models are large, and you might not be using every tag available. You should document which tags you are using and what purpose each tag serves in your content set. You will want to make it relatable to the doc type's original purpose for that tag. Consult the doc type specification to understand the tags and their purpose and decide how that applies to your content. For example, we had a medical device customer who built surgical implements with various hand tools that can be attached and swapped out. We decided that it was user interface because the hand tool is the interface being used by the user to interact with the machine. As a result, they decided to use UI control tag to mark it up in running text. As always, examples, examples, examples. What are your nesting rules? Do lists go in the paragraph or are they siblings? Are they peer elements? Do you allow nested topics or should all topics be separate and joined through a map construct? What about tables? There's more than one type available to you. Which one gets used under what conditions? You might also want to talk about key structures, naming conventions, profiles, and filtering. All of these are suitable for inclusion at this level style guide because they can have ripple effects in downstream processing. If you don't get it right in the markup, you can guarantee the downstream processing will not come out right and you won't get what you want. Likewise, if you add a new profile, you need to know how it intersects with the others and which content is affected and any content currently under differentiation with the old profiles needs to get the new one added to it or adjusted to accommodate. Document all of this and what each one means. All of the decisions that went into the content construction and processing, all of the whys, they should all be included here because you'll never remember. If you win the lottery and move to Fiji, someone else will be able to take over for you without missing a step. This is that institutional memory we were talking about before. You can also include some of these other things if you haven't already addressed them in another level style guide. Tag and attribute values that trigger actions in processing, like landscape page orientation. Are you rotating text on the portrait page or are you actually rotating the page to landscape orientation? And what tag or attribute triggers that change? What elements are you supporting? Which ones are you not? Every group writing documentation finds they have specific information patterns that develop in their content. Likewise, do you have a task with substeps, or do you want to join sets with a map construct so they're grouped together? What are your information patterns and how do you implement them? It matters so you can guarantee consistent presentation of the information to your users. You're effectively training them in what to expect and how to interact with your content. Every group writing documentation finds specific information patterns that develop in their content. Likewise, do you have a task with substeps, or do you want to join sets of tasks with a map construct so they're grouped together? What are your information patterns and how do you implement them? It matters so that you can guarantee consistent presentation of information to your users. You're effectively training them in what to expect and how to interact with your content. If you're working with DITA, then you know that one topic answers one question well. And as a team, you have to decide how to use the DITA content model with respect to your content. What type of topic should be used for any particular piece of content? For example, product overview. Do you all agree that it's a concept or should it be a reference? What's the guiding principle for deciding which topic type to use? Maps, are they only for deliverables? Or can they be used for packaging of smaller content units? What are your reuse strategies? Do you use warehouse topics? Do you use conrefs or con key refs? And at what level do you use them? When do you use one over the other? For a slightly more complex example at a completely different level, let's say you're creating on product help and that all the software development team will give you is a single landing page. 
you have to figure out how to construct this page as a jumping off point while still making it relevant and complete for expert users. And the pattern you establish will be used again and again. All of that goes in a style guide at this level. And like the others, this is another living document. Here's an example. I got this from the Data Best Practices book by Laura Bellamy and others. This guideline has a description, but it also has a title which is necessary to evaluate the effectiveness of the short description. Then it shows a good and bad example to demonstrate. Writers can look at this and understand whether they're doing things the way they should be. By having both good and bad examples, you can learn through comparison and identify how to improve a bad one and turn it into a great one. This book is full of these kinds of examples, and it's a great resource to have at your disposal. Now that's a lot of style guides. I've shown you four, and we haven't even talked about process. Here's what you should remember. External style guides are group specific and cover basic situations. You want to extend those guides to cover your specific writing style. You want to add specifications to cover your formatting, and you want to add tagging guidelines for your XML environment, especially if you're working in DITA. That's four things to do, and it's a lot. They can become big, messy, and unwieldy, but there are things you can do to mitigate the overhead. Start small and hit the immediate needs first. Get the low-hanging fruit that gives you the biggest and immediate improvement in the content that is high-touch or that writers are frequently changing. Don't be overly comprehensive. I know that some of us tend to be pack ratty. If it gets too big, no one will use it. So you can break it up. You can use templates. It doesn't all have to be in one big document. I know that ArborText has all kinds of features that can instantiate different style guidelines without a lot of overhead and that fall in line with author work processes, simply to improve their lives. Other tools likely have things like that as well. Make use of whatever you have. Turn it into an online website and search with a TOC. This can help make your style guide more accessible and usable. We've all been trained to search, so this can be a really good option and improvement over one giant PDF. It also helps to think of your style guide like it's another deliverable and treat it accordingly. In this case, the customer is you and your team. Giving it the respect it deserves will increase your success and improve usage. Use that same professionalism to write your style guide as you would any other deliverable. The last bit of advice I'll share is to establish a governance board. There are multiple benefits for doing so. First, you can rotate who participates and make sure everyone on the team has a chance to be involved. Involvement increases acceptance. You're all working together. Plus, different eyes see different things. Your style guide will be better when you have more contributors coming together. Now it is okay to have a single owner for the guide. A single person can help facilitate disagreements, making final rulings, and be a recognizable voice for communicating change. You might rotate this position so everyone understands the responsibilities associated with the role. It is far easier to be tolerant of someone else when you've been in their shoes. Here are some resources. The slides are available on the website, as are links to the TC Dojo webinars and on style guides by Keith Shangali Roberts and Kathy Jones. A lot of companies also have published their style guides online, and it can be interesting to see how they differ and compare. The Amazon product page style guide isn't for Amazon's help writers. It's for the vendors who are writing product pages for their products. And it's interesting to see how they tell people to write for Amazon. Lastly. Here are the DITA resources we recommend. Two of these are short links because we recommend them so frequently. All are good if you're learning about DITA and starting to create your DITA style guide. All of these links are also already on the website. So feel free to go there to click and not have to write them all down. It's also in the download material attached to this session. Thanks for attending. I'm Liz Fraley, and be sure to connect with me on LinkedIn.